At the age of 15, endurance swimmer Lynn Cox swam the English Channel. And then a man from Springfield, Mass, Davis Hart, broke my time. So I went back and broke his time. Then she swam across the Bering Strait and changed the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. By her courage, she showed how close to each other our two peoples live. If you believe in something and you really want to do it, you keep trying because that's what life is about. Lynn dove into another adventure one day when she saw a video of a dog leaping out of a helicopter into a lake in northern Italy whose purpose was to rescue a person in the water. The dog was from the Italian School of Water Rescue Dogs, canines that work as lifeguards and patrol 30 of Italy's busiest beaches. They go along the coast of Italy, but also on the patrol boats with the Italian Coast Guard. The book, Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog, the Making of a Super Athlete, was born after she made a visit to the school in Italy. It tells the inspiring story of an enthusiastic Newfoundland puppy named Al, who, along with several other candidates, is hoping to become one of these fearless lifesavers. I saw these dogs leaping on a helicopters into the lake in northern Italy on a video. And I just thought, this is incredible. How do they train to do this? This is so much more than teaching a dog to sit or come or stay. For today's conversation, which was also attended by a local Newfoundland group, Lynn talks about her accomplishments, her new book, and her fascination with courage. You're an open water, long distance swimmer that has held many records from being the fastest and the boldest. Tell us a little bit about your athletic career. I started doing these open water swims when I was 14 years old. My goal was just to swim across the Catalina Channel with a group of kids. We did it, it took us 12 and a half hours and my friends decided they never wanted to do anything like that again. <laughs> But I was so excited because I thought maybe I could do the English Channel. So I talked to my folks and started training with Don Gambrell, who was the US, water polo, US uh, Olympic coach. And he basically adapted these pool swimming techniques to the open water. So I went to England and at 14 trained for it, age 15 broke the world record for men and women. And then a man from Springfield, Mass, Davis Hart broke my time. So I went back and broke his time. And, and then I realized you can spend your life doing the English Channel, and there are people that do it 20 and 30 and 40 times, and I decided it was time to do other things. You know, I was watching an interview about you earlier today, and it was talking about, you were saying something like you did swim practice, but then you had so much energy left over, and your coach is like, well, maybe you should swim like longer distances or something. Tell me that story. So I was swimming in a pool where I was pretty much the slowest one, and in the pool were the best people, the best swimmers in the world. And I just thought, I really want to be like them. But I just wasn't as fast as they were. And at the end of the workout, my coach recognized my potential. He saw that I was not tired, that I had incredible endurance. So he was the one that said, why don't you think about swimming in the open ocean? So that's where it started. How were you able to accomplish this at such a young age? I had great support from my parents. You know, when I was training and swimming five, six, seven miles offshore, along the shore, my parents would take time turns walking the beach with me. So if it was a 10 mile workout, my mom would walk 10 miles along the beach, or my dad to help me establish a pace. And when I was training to get used to the cold, my dad was a doctor and he was suggesting, okay, in the wintertime in California, sleep with your windows open, uh, wear less clothing, try to get your body active acclimated to the cold because the English Channel at that time was about 56 to 60 degrees and many people who attempt the English Channel don't make it because they can't handle the cold. So I was learning how to train to acclimate to the cold. 
You may be best known for crossing the Bering Strait in 1987, a journey that was actually not allowed, but brought about world change. Share that story with us. Well, it actually took 11 years to get permission. I initially wrote to Brezhnev, and then Andropov, and Chenyenko, and finally Gorbachev, in addition to senators and congressmen and people in the foreign State Department and the Foreign Service in the Soviet Union and anyone that had any connection with the Soviets. And finally, Gorbachev gave his approval for the swim. I love that nothing really stops you is what it seems like. Well, if you believe in something and you really want to do it, you keep trying because that's what life is about. You know, it's like if you give up on your dreams, you give up on what you're really all about. Tales of Al, the water rescue dog, the making of a, of a super athlete. So tell us how you were first connected with the famous water rescue dog training school in Italy. I saw these dogs leaping out of helicopters into the lake in northern Italy on a video. And I just thought, this is incredible. How do they train to do this? This is so much more than teaching a dog to sit or come or stay. How do you do this? And what kind of method is it? Are the dogs afraid? Are they being pushed to doing it? Are they helping because they want to? So I wound up going to Italy and being invited to watch the group in Italy train the dogs, which was fantastic because they were training like we did on the swim team. They had the beginning swimmers learning to swim in one lane, then the intermediate, then the advanced and the elite. And their trainers, their owners, were swimming with them as much as the dogs were. So the Newfoundlands, when they were trained for like a mile swim, the owners was doing a mile swim. But beyond that, they were doing this to basically patrol the beaches in Italy and to rescue people that were in trouble. And did I read that they're volunteers? Yes, they're complete volunteers. They train from spring through summer into fall, and then they go with their dogs. They're Labradors, Newfoundlands, German Shepherds, Leonbergers, and Newfoundlands, and they go along the coast of Italy, but also on the patrol boats with the Italian Coast Guard. Why Newfoundlands? Well, the Newfoundlands were initially chosen because the uh, man that had the idea for the school, Ferruccia Palinga, had a Newfoundland, and his daughter and her friend were in the water offshore off the coast of Italy, and a current pulled them out, and the dog understood that they were in trouble, and he went in and rescued them. So Ferruccio thought, you know, maybe there's a way to harness the dog's natural ability and, and create a school. So he started doing it, and then other dogs started participating. But the Newfoundlands are really terrific rescuers because they have such big paws, they're webbed, they swim in inverted, an abbreviated breaststroke, so they're really strong and powerful, but also they can pull in about six people at a time. So, but also, I mean, not to dismiss the Labradors and the Golden Retrievers and the others, they can pull in two or three people. And the way they do it is, is really interesting. Uh, the dogs are trained to go out and swim out to a person and around them and look at the person. And then if the, do if the person's okay with the dog, then they present a handle on top of the harness. And the harness is inflated so that they're very high in the water. So as soon as somebody grabs onto the, to the handhold, they're lifted up in the water and then the dog pulls them to shore. And it's just it's spectacular to watch it, but it's even more fun to do it. We're going to get to that in just a minute. So we meet a lot of dogs in the book, including uh, several dogs that are experienced water rescue animals. But the heart of the book is Al, obviously, a dog that really struggles with learning the skills and the discipline needed. What about Al really captured your heart? Well, I think it was because she was so rambunctious and she had so much energy and you could tell that she was just such a bright dog. And the thing about her was that she was owned by Donatella Pasquale, who was vice president of the school. And she had trained so many dogs and so many people and saw their potential. But she wasn't able, it seemed, to get through to Al. So it was really difficult because here I am visiting Italy to watch the dogs perform and her dog doesn't seem to be getting it. But there's a point where she's working through this level of, of training where she's going to take Al to go out 
and be on one of the Italian lifeguard boats. And if she can pass this test, then she becomes one of the elite water rescue dogs and is able to patrol the shores along with the Italian Coast Guard. So it's a very critical time that I arrive there, and it's very tense, and I'm wondering what's going to happen. And we're not going to tell you what happens. You have to read the book. And there is one part where you're going to be like, no way. Oh, my God. I, love I, I wish I could tell you, but I'm not going to. Okay. Um, so this is what I was thinking. You saw, was it Moss that you saw a video of online? Moss is a big Newfoundland dog. What was it like seeing Moss online, traveling around the world to meet her, and then all of a sudden she's like, coming up to you, was it just kind of a surreal moment? It was actually that. I mean, it was just amazing because she was the huge black Newfoundland that was leaping out of a red helicopter into the lake. And then suddenly I'm now in Italy and I've told that I can go out in the water and Mass is gonna rescue me. So I do the lift my arms and splash the water to signal that I'm in trouble. And Ferruccio lets her go and she comes right out toward me but she goes around in a wide circle. And as she goes around, she looks at me. And then she comes in closer and presents the handle on, the, on top of the vest. And you were saying that she was kind of looking at you to make sure you weren't afraid. Right, but I didn't know that. So I'm like thinking, why isn't this dog just coming and letting me hold on? Mm -hmm. But I found out afterwards, there was so much thought in this training because there are people that are terrified of dogs. So they're taught not just to approach a person right away. They're told to check them out. But also culturally, there are people that think that dogs are really dirty and they don't want to get near them. So along with the dogs going out to make the rescues, the owner or the trainer from the school will go as well to make sure that if they don't accept the dog helping them, then the owner can help them in. And so that's really great because if I have a dog and you have a dog, we'll swap dogs so the dogs get used to going to anyone and helping anyone that's in trouble. So whenever you saw Moss coming for you, and I know you grabbed, uh, you grabbed the vest. Yeah, oh, well, the, the handle on top. The handle on the top. And you, it was interesting because you're like, well, I let go just to see what was going to happen. Oh. And then what happened? Well, she immediately turned around and she felt the resistance shift. She swam around me again and presented the handle and I held on again. So she kept pulling me towards shore and I thought, okay, I'll try this again. And I let go again and she swam around me like, are you stupid? <laughs> Hold on here. So I held on and then we went ashore and then we were able to do it again. I mean, that was, it was like so much fun yeah. because you could tell that she just loved doing it. And, and she was the star of the group at that time. And to see this huge dog coming towards you, swimming in the sea to rescue you, that has got to be an amazing feeling. It was, and, but also I was like thinking, you know, I'm not tiny, so I might be, it might be too hard for her to pull me to shore, you know? And, and I noticed that her head was kind of low in the water, and I realized, oh, that's because she wants to get her hips up, so she becomes more hydrodynamic, just like a pool swimmer, you know, or an open water swimmer. They, they think so much, in fact, there was one yellow um, golden retriever, a female, who was so interesting because she was such a slow and elegant swimmer, like the little old lady with the flowers on her cap, the blue, the pink. And I, <laughs> I imagined her doing that. And then at some point, they allowed the dogs to race each other. And so she suddenly took a big breath of air, put her face in the water, blew bubbles, and lifted her hips up, and then went by all the others. She just knew how to swim. Amazing, yeah, exactly. amazing. And I think earlier you were saying that Newfies, like, their chest is shaped like a ship or something, and that helps as well. The, yeah, it's shaped like a keel of a boat, so that they're, they're streamlined through the water. And they also use their tail like a rudder to help them balance in the water. The Newfoundlands, though, are so adept for the water because they were initially bred to be dogs that help fishermen off the coast of Newfoundland. And they would pull in the net so they'd hold on to these very long lines that were very thick and they'd have to swim them to shore with the with the cod inside and they had to be able to breathe so they were bred to have loose lips so they could breathe while they were pulling in the lines as you visited with them you witnessed them learning to communicate and trust each other tell us more about this relationship and the importance of trust well, one of the things that I saw them doing was teaching the puppies to swim. And that was so much fun because you could see that they were just starting to coordinate their paws. And they, they would support the puppies and keep their heads high above the water so they never felt 
in any kind of fear or danger. And then as the puppy started coordinating the paws over the course of a few days, then they would give him a little less support. And I just kept thinking, this is exactly the way my parents taught my brother and sisters and me to swim. It was that gradual getting used to it, getting stronger, getting the rhythm, and then basically learning to swim. And I do love how you start out this book telling the story of what made you fall in love with swimming and dogs and your dog growing up. It was really a beautiful thing to read. It was such a great transition into Al and these dogs that you were doing a story about. Why did you decide to give a personal story first? Well, I think that, you know, the, the story itself was about Al, but there was also stories about water and dogs and how dogs help us through our lives. And there were a couple of situations that I wrote about where there were kids that had been absolutely traumatized by bad swimming instructors. And so it turns out that they had dogs, and I wound up using their dogs to teach them how to swim. And so it was just such a great way to say, you know, you find out what motivates somebody, anyone, and that opens up all sorts of possibilities. So that seemed like a great way to transition from how I became involved with dogs and swimming and then just marveling at what they were doing in Italy because it was such, it was such an extreme elite group of people because of what they do and because of the dogs themselves. I do love how you weave back and forth in the book and you talk about the dogs, but then you talk about your personal life as well, because it's interesting. It's nice to get to know you as well. I'm glad. <laughs> You're kind of a big deal, Lynn. I don't know if you knew that, but. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's, it's really fun to share stories and share stories about things that you relate to. For instance, there was one point where I was watching the dogs leaping from the helicopters 10 or 12 feet off the water. And I realized that, you know, if you hit wrong, it really hurts. And part of my training had been at the Belmont Plaza pool where you watch the national divers training and often they wiped out and when they did you could just hear the smack across the whole natatorium so i kept thinking you know are these dogs happy to be doing this and how do they do it safely but i saw there was progression that they didn't just have them one day jump out of a helicopter and and the things they learned part of it was instinct you know part of it was something they already knew but or something they developed and then were able to grasp and there's a lovely section at the beginning of the book that captures your thoughts on courage as you first watch one of the dogs leap out of the helicopter. So what did this experience teach you about courage? I think that for me, looking at the water, there's, it's, for many people it's life and for many people it's death. Either people find joy in it or are terrified by it. So the idea that there's always that first step where somebody will go into the water and then the next step where they will let go and start to swim. And I think it takes so much courage to take that next step. So I felt like it was really important to write about that theme of courage throughout the book and to see, you know, wonder, are these dogs showing courage or is it instinct or is it something that's really trained? But what I really, really saw was that the owners and the dogs develop these incredible bonds and the trust that goes with that, I think, helps to spur their courage. So you think yeah. it is courage over instinct? I think it's both. I think it's both. I, I, I think that the other thing is that the, this way it's set up is that if a dog isn't able to perform something, then they back away from it. But most of the time I saw these dogs eagerly attempting something new. And I think that that in a way is courageous, not to just stay where you are and not for the dogs just to stay in one place. Do you think, as I was trying to delve into the mind of Lynn Cox when I was reading this book, I was thinking, do you think you have a fascination or just kind of a love of courage? Because you are so courageous, and then you see these dogs doing what they're doing, and you do kind of wanted to get into their mind, too. Is courage a big uh, thing for you? Courage is a really big thing for me. It's like how does somebody stand up against something that they don't believe in? How do you speak out when you're the only voice? How do people find a way through huge adversity and lead others out. Those are themes that have been something that have, has attracted my attention all my life. I mean, I remember reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn when I was a teenager and, and looking at what is the struggle, how do they overcome it, how, how do they really speak when others won't. And I really admire that. So I think that that's something that I always have been interested in. See, I get you, Lynn. I get you. <laughs> 
Uh, of course, you were in Italy, and the book describes many delicious meals that you spent with the instructors at the training school, and even the dogs were rewarded with the delicious-sounding biscottis, right? Mm, yes. Uh, can you tell us about the importance of food in this story? Well, part of the story is told over a very long Italian dinner. And I love to try new things, and I love Italian food. So I went into great depth about what the different dishes were. And, and through the different courses, we discussed stuff. So it's just like being on a swim team or a triathlon team or any kind of team, you know, volleyball team, where you work out really hard or you be, do a big game and you finish, and then you get together afterwards to discuss what happened. And that's exactly what was happening is we were, they were talking about which dog had been performing well, which one needed some more work, how they were going to help the instructor. So it was, but it was fun, but at the same time, my Italian is really, really limited. So there was a man named Roberto who was there that was acting as a translator for much of that dinner. Um, when you first called the school to tell them you wanted to come meet the rescue dogs and possibly write a book about it, did you have to name drop who you are? <laughs> Just say, listen, I'm Lynn Cox. I'm kind of a big deal. Actually, <laughs> actually, I don't even know if they knew my background. Oh, no way. Uh, really. So what happened was a friend of mine was a naval aviator, a pilot in the Navy. And he knew the naval attache at the U.S. Embassy in Rome. So I reached out to the naval attache because I thought maybe he would know the Italian Coast Guard and through them maybe I could figure out how to get a hold of the school. So the invitation came from the US Embassy through the school and they knew that I swam but they didn't know to the extent that I, of my background. Oh, in goodness. fact, it was so weird because when I first went there, they let me get in the water and they told me that I had to put on a huge life jacket that was really floating and I'm like, <laughs> It's 50 meters out there. I think I can do it without <laughs> drowning. But at the same time was that this is what they did. about. It was all about safety. Mm -hmm. So I put on the life jacket because I was part of this group and I wanted to do whatever they were doing. But I just thought that was so weird. <laughs> it's so funny. How do you wear a life jacket? I'm just exactly. swimming the channel. I don't know. Uh, so I definitely cried at a bunch of parts of this book because dogs that are heroes and amazing just touch my heart so much. Uh, tell this, kind of tell the story a little bit about Seaman and Lewis and Clark. There were so many Newfoundlands involved in history. It's amazing. Actually, I came here to St. Louis to one of the libraries to do research on Seaman because he was Lewis and Clark. He was Lewis's dog, Mary Willow Lewis. They were going to do cross, make, do the Northwest Passage, and they decided to get or Mary Leva Lewis decided to get Seaman as a dog to go along with him. And he wound up protecting them from bears. He was also stolen by Native American Indians. He wound up also protecting them from um, buffalo attacks, bison attacks. So the dog became very loyal to Lewis throughout this entire journey and helped them make it to the Pacific Ocean and came back with him. Uh, you were talking about a possible movie about you. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, Chris Carter, who wrote The X-Files and produced and directed it, over the last couple of years has worked on a script now, and he's working on getting it produced as a film. So we're excited, really excited about that. Who's going to play Lynn Cox? That's what we need to know. Who's it going to be? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and um, also mention your website. We want to get that out there. So if, if any of you are interested in this nationwide book tour or have friends or family along the way, if you just go to www.linnecox.com, you can see we're now, I've done the stage one and stage two of the book tour, and now we're on stage three. Um, and also it gives you all sorts of background on the other books that I've written. What was your favorite swim of all time? You know, it's sort of like talking to somebody and saying, who's your favorite child or your favorite <laughs> dog? Yeah, it's just each swim that I did at the time I did it was the most important thing to me. And I couldn't have gone on to the next one had I not done the previous one. Mm -hmm. So, but there were experiences on some of the swims that were amazing, like the swim that I did across Cook Strait, where after five hours of swimming, I was further from the finish than when I had started and just kept going for hours, up to, well, 12 hours and two and a half minutes, but people from all over the country called out to the boat encouraging me to keep going. Even the prime minister called out and said, you have the support of the country of New Zealand with you. So that was really, really important. But also the Bering Strait, 
and you know, and that if I hadn't done the English Channel, that none of that would have happened. You know? You're not afraid of sharks or anything, jellyfish. I'm afraid of sharks, but you know, I did a swim. I was the first person to swim around the Cape of Good Hope, but wound up getting a special forces team from Cape Town, South Africa, to be spotters and to watch for sharks. And jellyfish, you know, there are problems with them, and I have been stung. And you try to have a crew on board that's watching the water for you, and you try to avoid them. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm doing the swims, I'm not wearing a wetsuit. It's always just a bathing suit, bathing cap, and goggles. Oh, what's uh, next? Any books on the horizon for you? Actually, I have a children's book that's going to be coming out next year. And so I'm really excited about it. It has the theme of endurance and cold and, no, actually, just endurance and uh, wide scope and geography and, you know, the oceans. Sort of the themes that I focus in on. Amazing. Yeah. Lynn Cox, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much.